Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Tony. It's a pleasure. Um, I was remiss to mention to, to you guys that Tony's responsible for the great on Hulu as well. You're the creator of that show. True. Yeah. Um, amazing show. Um, your language in this film is extraordinary, and I, I wanted to start with that. It's, it's old English that has been modernized. It's a very unique language that you've created. Yeah, I think when, um, when Yorgos first gave me the book and I knew his vision for the, this sort of fantasy nature of the movie and that it was period, but I also was very conscious of allowing an audience into the movie in a contemporary way. So it was like trying to create a, a, a way with the dialogue that would feel still like we were in a world that was period and not our own, but also contemporary enough that we could access it and it felt like characters we could connect with. Um, so that was a big part of writing the script as well as Bella's dialogue is so reflective of her journey. So it was like how to take her from a kid to a teenager to a young adult woman to a, and also take her through you know, like just encountering the world as a kid, as a young woman, you know, sexually, politically, intellectually, you had to go through all these things and it had to reflect all the time in the evolution of her dialogue, which was fun because you don't usually get that in a movie. Someone speaks one way for the whole movie, whereas this was like, I was always like, how does she speak in the boat? And what are the words she could use? And, and what, was, what was enough evolution and what was too much and what words would work and what were like not work and make a mess of the whole movie. You know? well, was that a challenge for the actors to speak in this, in no, this language? Not really. I think, um, well, they didn't mention it, so <laughs> maybe they mentioned it to Yorgos. No, I don't think so, because I think though Yorgos is really conscious of language and he, he knows how I write, so he's really, and obviously Emma and I and him have worked together a few times, you know, so she very much is a language so good at language and so good at grounding it into the emotional life of the character. So I think he was just, he's always good at, you know, he's such a good instinct for casting and who's going to be able to do the stuff. Um, you, you based it on the book, yeah. and, and, but the book doesn't take your approach, which is the point of view of Bella. Yeah. Can you tell us, you know, how you, you gravitated to this choice of centering it on Bella? Yeah, I think that, yeah, because the book is, her story is told by all the men. They kind of tell you through letters and various ways of telling you. You don't really get, she doesn't have a perspective in the story. Um, which is, it was also when I read the book and Yorgos was very, you know, from the start he was like, you know, it's got to be about Bella, how are we going to do that? And um, she's got to be the centre of the story. But in the book, we never know what her experience is in a way. And so it was for us to put her at the centre and create what the experience of, of that would be for her. And, um, yeah, and that was sort of most of the work and the joy of the thing because we had some tent poles from the book, but we also, you know, I also got to invent. So we're, we're sort of like, what happens in Portugal? Well, I don't know. Well, when I go to Portugal, I eat Portuguese tarts, so that'll be that. <laughs> You know, so, yeah, so we sort of invented each piece of it. Yeah, which leads me to my next question. The, the, the sort of grand tour that she undertakes, it starts in the home where it's kind of, it's a prison. Then she goes to Lisbon where she encounters romance. Then the boat, um, which is a form of escape. I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth. I mean, but the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of the journey in the chapters, is yeah. that something that you delineated that... Yeah, very much so. Yeah, because that was, yeah, that was a lot of the work was trying to delineate the evolution of her and the escape from that place to Lisbon, which was also like the place, you know, every, you know, at that time in Europe, that was where everyone went and boats left to discover the world kind of thing. So it was like that would be the point where she would discover the world. And then it would also be the point where suddenly at the end of that point, someone tried to control her and took her and kidnapped her onto a boat, but then that would lead her to her sort of intellectual awakening. You know, I guess Lisbon was the sexual awakening and then um, the boat was the political awakening and also the kind of more complicated relationship awakening, mm -hmm. that it was like, 
at the start it's fun, but then it encompasses him being cruel to her and her being cruel to him and her understanding that that's happening. And then once we got to Paris, it was, it was sort of her letting go of that and kind of just adventuring into the world, sort of as we said, as a sort of... I think on the boat we were like, it's like she's just come out of college going, I've got ideas and I've read some books. And then she went into the world and the world of Paris was a bit more like, I just want to adventure into the world and see what happens. And, and sort of stuff happened to her good and bad and her interpretation of that led her to sort of this idea she'd created herself. Um, and then coming home was like, how do I metabolise all that and all the past life Mm -hmm. at, at that time as well. So, yeah, it was all thinking like that. I also find it intriguing that Baxter, um, the Willem Dafoe character, yeah. also has his own, uh, you know, journey where, you know, he wants to possess her first yeah. and then slowly awakens to letting her go. Yeah, I think he was a great character too because in the book he's, he, he is... I think Yorgos was really good about how we led that and how we could create that character beyond just a Frankenstein scientist. And it was very much about he loved her, but he also was a scientist. So she was an experiment. She was a daughter. She was something he wanted to control, but she was also the only person he'd felt ever saw him. And so it was all of that. And then we wanted to... And also I kind of put in that he all these... Why he looked like that was partly because he was so a victim of trauma... And it was sort of gathering that all together and that he would go on this journey while she was away, which was to recognise those things so that when she came back, he could understand those things for himself. Um, where was this part of the book? But in your script, you tapped into so many tropes. You know, there is a bit of mystery, there is horror tropes, there is fairy tale, mythology, all blended in. Is that your creation? It's a bit... There was some of that in the book and then a lot of it was like... I think when Yorgos first talked about the movie to me, he kind of... I mean, we talked about it and I... Like, at first when he... It was such a complicated movie because, in a way, it was going to be a satire, it was going to be a fantasy, it was a coming-of-age story, it was a Frankenstein movie. It was all these things that had to link together um, and, and that's what he's so good at. And then for my job was to kind of make that unified um, and kind of carry it through, I guess. Did you ever feel that you couldn't do this, yes. the task? <laughs> yes. Well, funny you should mention it. I did about 70 pages into the first draft, wrote to him and went, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> I said, I'm 70 pages in. I don't know if it works. Um, and we're very... Good friends, I'll add. And so, uh, and this is, but this is also what it's like to work for him. Yeah, I wrote, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think I'm making it work. I don't know how good it is. I, I had a real, like, it's, this is hard. And he wrote back to me and wrote, this, this was always going to be very hard. It's going to be worth it. Keep going, finish the draft, just send it to me, and, you know, y y we'll have lunch. So, uh, so that's because our process is driven around lunch. And so it, we're all about lunch. Um, so I, that's what we did. I finished the draft and it actually came out really well. It was just me kind of having a bit of a moment. But, um, yeah, and I think... So, yeah, I did think it was... When I first read it, I thought... I'd never adapted a book and I thought, this is not the book to start on. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and can you tell us about the, the world in which you put Bella in? It feels like the past but it also feels very futuristic, almost like sci-fi. Um, tell us about developing the world. Yeah, I, I'll, speak, I'll speak to my friend, Yorgos, for this, and he apologised. He I rang him this morning in the hotel. He's quite sick. We have you. Yeah, we have me, exactly. I'll try to do a Greek accent occasionally. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he was... Uh, like, when he talked about it to me, it was fantasy, and we talked about movies that... And, uh, you know, from his point of view or from my point of view, there was a European sensibility of those big movies in the... You know, Fellini movies and stuff like that. that was the Ship Sails yeah, On. Yeah, Ship Sails On was literally something I watched um, when I was thinking about the movie. Uh, and then he's so brilliant because when he came to design it, he was like... He couldn't think of what designer he wanted. And then he found... He had this idea where he found a production designer who'd done one film... Johnny, who did The Nest, but had been an art director. And then he found Shona, who wasn't, had never worked on a film in her life. 
and she's more like a person, she works in fashion, she works for Tim Walker, the photographer, um, but she's quite brilliant. And he just said to them, you know, I remember having lunch with him and he's like, I've put them in a room for two weeks. They didn't know each other, they never met. He's like, and I said to them, come back to me with some ideas. And, and that's what's great, they did. They worked brilliantly together and he built this fantasy world. Because I think he didn't, I think the past and the future thing for him was, he didn't want it pegged into the past. He didn't want everyone to be able to place it like that. Because it wasn't a real world and he was very conscious of that. And so they created this sort of, as Johnny said, this kind of theme park Lisbon mm -hmm. that you're kind of like, what, what is it, you know? Is that, I mean, I, 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 I'm glad you brought up Fellini and, and the ship sell, it sells on, but also there's this constant reminder that we're watching like a studio film and it reminded me of, of Powell and Pressburger films, you know, the, the red shoes. Yeah. There's this constant reminder that we're, we're in the studio. We're yeah. in this and I think that was very conscious on his part. He said, I know he said it in a lot of interviews, he did want to make a very a st old school studio based movie and you would know it was studio based. And that was very conscious for him, you know, of how he wanted to approach it. You know, he's very particular about how he sees everything, so. Were you involved with the, with, were you in on set? Oh uh, yeah, I'm on, yeah, I, I'm on set until I get bored and then I go home. <laughs> Which it's, ten minutes. it's literally like two days. Um, <laughs> once I've walked around the sets, I'm like, this is great. Well, he doesn't really, he doesn't need me. I mean, we've worked on the script and we've had a rehearsal. He has three weeks rehearsal and then we hone the script down and um, and then by the time I've, we've done that and then I'm on set for a couple of days and then occasionally I bring him a biscuit and, you know, say, do you need anything? He's like, no. And... Uh, and then I go home. I, I, but it was, I was on set a few times just because the actors were so great and the sets were so extraordinary. And my friend Holly did the costumes. And, you know, I visited her a lot to see how she was going. But And, and it's also that thing of working for someone like him was he just unleashes pe people's talents. That's mm -hmm. really what one of his great gifts is, that everyone's limits disappear and we're all kind of reaching for something we, we didn't know we were capable of. And that's how it felt when you're on set. You were like, wow, we're all just taking a big swing. I wonder if this is gonna work out, but yeah. Emma Stone is a producer of the film. Yeah. She's collaborated with you three times, Cruella and The, the Favorite and this yeah. film. Um, were you writing with her in mind? <clears throat> I wasn't at the start because um, we started just before we started The Favorite. Um, and then Yorgos told her the story because he doesn't, he's very, he doesn't share the script until it's basically 95% there, much to the studio. He won't even share it with the producers. They don't see it for years. Um, but he told Emma, Emma the story and she loved it. And then I think a year later she, he showed her the script and then she was on. Um, and then once I knew I had her, I think it was in my head a little bit because I know her voice so well. And I knew, but also it gives you such confidence because you're a bit like, well, I can write. She can do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so in, and so in my head, she quickly became Bella. And then on set, she, you know, she was Bella. And it's one of the most fearless performances. Oh, yeah. That's a, yeah. I think the first day I, when I watched it, my wife's an actor. I came home and I was like, I've never seen a braver throw at something. She was amazing. Mm -hmm. The character of Bella and her performance, she encounters no shame, no trauma. <laughs> you know, can you tell us about developing a character from that perspective? Yeah, I guess it was a mix of the satire of the movie about, <clears throat> you know, control, how there's sort of some insistent thing in our, in our human beings that we seem to want to control each other. And he was a person who had sort of skipped school as to how to be a human being, yeah, and <coughs> skipped society, and so that was kind of an important thing. She didn't have shame; she was just led by curiosity and instinct. And what would that be like? And they weren't all good instincts, you know. There, were, there was cruelty. There was a bunch of things. But I think it was it was kind of like a. I know for her, as I think that's one of the most intrinsic things for her of the character: the lack of shame. You know mm -hmm. that she kind of walks through life just with this optimistic. And curiosity about the world and lets it shape, you know, shapes her to a little bit, but also she's just on her own trip. Your script is so thematically rich. You can watch the film on the sur surface and just be enjoyed and going for the ride, but the more you start 
uh, studying it, you know, there is rich philosophical un underpinnings, there's politics, and of course, feminism. Can you tell us about, you know, layering all those different uh, thematic things? Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, it's all pretty, obviously, I'm incredibly wise, so that's helpful. <laughs> But I think, I think most of it's sort of subconscious to some degree. Like, I knew it was a philosophical movie on a lot of levels because it was about human beings and how we are poor things in that we, we are just too complicated and can't get out of our own ways and we, sometimes we mean well and it manifests in the worst ways possible. And so I, I kind of knew that was part of the movie for me and... Uh, and all you know, in the layers of the idea of control, because even in the, even reading the book, where the whole book, you know, analysis point was in writing all that that these men owned her story, and so even though we flipped it, that was still what this movie was about. You know that we were flipping it to give her the story, whereas the book went, here's all these men putting this, projecting this story onto this woman, and at the end of the book, there's two pages she tells her own story. And it's nothing to do with any of this, you know. They've made it all up, mm -hmm. and so I think so. It, it was there was richness in the book, and obviously there's richness in, you know. So it it, it lent itself to a lot of philosophy and a lot of things that Yorgos and I had kind of sort of think and talk about and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then the exploration of female sexuality. Um, you know, in Europe and other parts of the world, sex is not a big deal. It, 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 but were you concerned about going too far with the sexuality? Um, I wasn't, re I mean, was I concerned? I wasn't concerned as an artist because I was like, that's our job. I, I can't, we can't make a movie about, a coming of age movie about this woman without dealing with her sexuality. Yeah. And so, and I also know that in, when I write a sex scene, I'm, to, to me, it's, I'm writing a beat of the, her story, her emotional story. So everything in the brothel is there's an emotional beat behind every little section or whatever about what she's discovering. So I was never, and I know, I know Emma well, and I know Yorgos well, and I knew everything was gonna be really thoughtful. Um, you know, how people contend with that in the outside world, well, you know. People, you know, someone's going to hate it. Yeah. What can you? I mean, someone hates anything. I, Oprah gave five million dollars, and everyone's like, "How dare you!" <laughs> <laughs> so. um, um, we knew Emma was going to go for broke. Willem Dafoe, we expect him. Yeah. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, tell us about casting him. <laughs> um, it's we've never seen him no. be this way. He's amazing. Yeah. No, that was a yeah, that was a masterstroke. I think because he was a trope, he was a cad that we sort of had this unwrapping of. But I think by casting, like Mark is the least, he's like the nicest male human on earth. <laughs> <laughs> and he's cast him as this crazy worst person. And, and but he, he's just so funny. And when we came into, re I came into rehearsal after a week and I said to Yorgos, how's it going? And he was like, it's all good. He goes, Mark is He's so funny. I don't know what to do. It's so funny. <laughs> it's like it's wild. I should probably pull it in, but it's so funny. And uh, he was great. And then him and Emma just created this yeah. instant rapport. And, the, you know, I love the way they interact. It's Who's like incredible. Who's was it to go with Mark? Oh, um, Yogos. It's all, yeah, he's got it, his instincts around people and how things should be. And it is like a great gift because... We were talking about it last night because Jerskin, who did the music on the film, that's his first score ever. And not only is this his first score, Yorgos has no, he doesn't, he's never used a composer and he's, he's never seen how he could. Like, it doesn't make sense to him. So he can never find anyone who fits what he wants. And so it's been a thing for a couple of films. And then one day he said to me, um, I was listening to this music on the, uh, I think it was Spotify or YouTube. He found some guy, 5,000 hits. Um, he's, and then he found an album with like 20,000 hits and it was this English 27 year old kid um, and he said I think this is the music and so he rang Jerskin up who's like this very struggling musician writing these pop, very strange pop albums and he said I think you should come and score my movie <laughs> and, and he said not only and Jerskin went oh I can do that he goes we're going to do it like this I'm going to give you the script and we're going to score it off the script and afterwards, I'll put it into the movie. So before we shot a frame, he'd scored the entire movie. 
But he also had this instinct about this person in the same way he had an instinct about Mark, even though it was not such not an obvious call. Yeah. But but that's why, you know, that's why, you know, I think that's one of his real gifts about he has a real recognition of what people can do. One of the great roles is the one on the boat played by Hannah Shigula, yes. the great German yeah. actress. You know, tell us about about that character and also the casting of her. Yeah, Martha was like she was such an important piece because she was an older woman for uh, Bella to meet. Mm -hmm. And Bella's life at that point was defined by romance and defined by her relationship with Duncan. And it was sort of like at that point in the movie she meets someone who goes, yeah, you know what, eventually you leave all that behind and it's about what's in your head. It's about what you mean in the world and what you uncover. So she was a really important piece. And then Yorgos is, a, you know, she's like a royalty yeah. in uh, Europe. And then <laughs> and she's like 80 or something now. And he convinced her to come. And she's very funny. She, was, she, was, uh, she had this reputation as being devastating on set to people. In, in like a few words, like Emma told this story last night where you would come on set and she would go, hi, and Hannah would go, you look pale, are you unwell? <laughs> and then Yorgos would go rolling and she'd be like, <laughs> so she was, but they, they kind of loved it because she was sort of like this theatre of cruelty, but it was, um, <laughs> but she was so, she was also just so incredible because she's so, funny and easy and she's done like a hundred films and Work you know with fast yeah and exactly and so i think for yorgos in particular it was such a f great thing for him as a european to have her you know yeah um tell us about seeing the film for the first time and how did it live up to your expectations after so many years writing it um oh it was it was beyond my expectations i was just I was blown. Yeah, I think we were all. I think because we, you know, when you're making something and we knew it was kind of a weird thing, on some level. But I think when I saw it and we all first saw it, I think I was just blown away. I just couldn't believe I would be part of it and it would be something that, in my career, I would be like, oh well, I'm just so happy I was part of that and we got to make something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just felt grateful and excited really and how did that you talked about that impasse you had at page 75 how did it look on screen <laughs> it looked good well I also later on page 75 was the problem because uh, about two years into developing it we were having lunch and uh, we have these long silences between us and then both of us looked at each other and we went I think we hate the third act and uh, so then we co I completely had a new idea for the third act and we rewrote the entire third act. And so p maybe page 75, originally I was right, you know, that it was terrible there. But yeah, but the whole thing, yeah, I was just so happy for it. Well, it's an amazing achievement, Tony. And, thank you. And we're so glad to, that you came and well, you're here. Thank you, it's uh, very exciting to be here. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.